L.A. Knight comes up with his own theory and gets the ultimate redemption last night on SmackDown. And then, Knight gets acquainted with Paul Heyman. Could these be the seeds planted? L.A. Knight, yeah! Versus the Tribal Chief. And WWE sets in motion. EO Sky versus Asuka. Championship on the line. We have a date. The match is set. We're going to talk all about it. It's SmackDown. Friday, September 8th, 2023. On the Amped Up Podcast. Lock in those earbuds. Smash those ups. Grab your coffees. And let's... Get amplified. And before we kick off this SmackDown review Friday, September 8th, 2023, a main event of AJ Styles versus Jimothy Uso. LA Knight with a massive redemption tour started, but he ends up coming across Paul Heyman who has some choice words for Knight. And Knight's response is kind of shocking and befuddling. We'll cover it all. Also, an unorthodox tag match for the ladies. We'll discuss it. And the epic face-off between EO Sky, your women's champion, and Asuka. A match highly anticipated by most of the wrestling world. A dream match still for most of us. Now, they've wrestled in the past, but as the macho man Randy Savage would say, that was just a piece, just a piece of what these ladies can do. Asuka, Io, we have a date. The match is happening. Title on the line. We're going to talk all about it. It's coming up in today's Amped Up podcast covering and featuring SmackDown's review. And a little bit of a channel update before we get this review rocking. BC will be covering the entire 2023 Green Bay Packers NFL season on this channel going forward. That is huge. I will be covering the Packers, guys, throughout 2023, hopefully into 2024, because that would mean we made the playoffs and maybe even went to the Super Bowl. I know, without Rodgers and with Jordan Love, that's laughable, but we're going to hold out hope. (laughs) But I will be covering the entire Packers season. I'm excited to do such. Um, That is not going to affect the pro wrestling content on this channel at all. You will still be getting the Raw reviews, the SmackDown reviews, the pay-per-view reviews, possibly, most likely, even live You're going to be getting the pop-up live streams, all of the wrestling news, WWE, AEW, Impact, the local bingo hall. You'll be getting all of it. None of it will be affected, guys. In fact, you're just going to get more content. It just has to do with the Packers and the NFL, not wrestling. But it's on days we really don't put out a lot of wrestling content anyway, like Sunday, for instance. Early Sunday morning, you'll get the Packers preview, whoever the Packers are facing that week on that day. And then the next morning, Monday morning, you'll get the review, the Packers versus whoever, and how that game went. If you thought BC watches Wrestling Amplified and reviews Pro Wrestling Amplified, wait till you hear how I watch and review my Packers. That's a whole nother level of amplification, BC (laughs) 5.0. But uh, if it's not your thing, which I know that is very, very niche. That's niche on top of niche on top of niche. Um, in fact, it's most likely just going to be for BC's own entertainment and maybe five to 10 other Green Bay Packer fans that end up finding the, the podcast. So I understand it might not be your thing. Pass it up. Wait for more pro wrestling content. There's going to be plenty throughout the week, like always. Um, so that does not affect the pro wrestling content at all, guys. You're just getting two more podcasts and it's on, it's at time frames where we don't really put up a lot of pro wrestling anyway. So if you don't want to hear a a, a second of it, just pass it up and wait for the next wrestling vid to come out in podcast. But I'm pretty excited about it. Um, Again, I know it's very, very niche, but 
We are going to open up the horizons and do some more business with the NFL and start covering my Packers, man. And now that we have this podcast format down on this platform, I can now travel and do these podcasts. Whereas I wanted to do this in the past years, but because of travel and just certain scenarios, we couldn't really do it. But now I found out a way that I can still travel, handle all my business out in the world, coast to coast, and still provide plenty of podcasts for you guys, whether pro wrestling or the Green Bay Packers. In the future, I might even do my New York Yankees. So again, it's just BC's passions, and this is what I like to put up on the BC Amplified channel. So that's a big channel update that does not change the upload schedule for pro wrestling vids. You will still be getting all of those podcasts and probably then some. So, But if there are any Packer fans out there, get ready, man, because we're about to get amplified. All right, let's move on to the business at hand. Pyro cascades throughout the garden in Boston, Massachusetts. Kevin Patrick then informs us that we're kicking off SmackDown with royalty. Now, BC is thinking King Booker, Jerry the King Lawler, Queen Zelina, Queen Latifah, anybody but Charlie Flair, please. (laughs) But of course, it was Charlie Flair. She gets nearly as much pyro as the entire show opening. She tags up with Shotzi to take on Bailey and Io of Damage Control. And by the way, before we get to the actual match itself, did anyone catch the promotional ads that went out before this match? A couple of hours before SmackDown hit the airwaves, they, they usually issue promotional ads. Um, and, and they send it out to whoever is subscribed to WWE or just out to the network. And this is no joke. They had this tag team match advertised. Shotzi and Charlotte versus Bailey and Io. And they actually, in the promotional, they actually called Charlie Flair the Alpha Queen. Now, I don't know if they've been calling her that, but that's the first time I caught that. The Alpha Queen. But that's not even the issue. The the bigger story here is what they called Shotzi. Shotzi is being called... The unorthodox wild woman. (laughs) You gotta just laugh because it's so damn horrible. Shotzi is called the unorthodox wild woman. What in the world is it? Do they really believe that that's going to get Shotzi over? The unorthodox wild woman tagging up with the alpha queen. You can't make this up, man. Anyway, referee Jessica Carr is calling the action for these four ladies. And these four ladies wrestled for about 60 seconds. And then we went right into a four-minute commercial break. When we were back from break, they wrestled another four minutes. Shotzi would pin Bailey via pinfall. It was a modified DDT. And I was interested to know what she calls it. But Kevin Patrick had no idea either. So he literally just says, Shotzi for the cover. Shotzi for the cover. What's the move, Kevin Patrick? What is the move? She just applied a finisher. What was it? The modified DDT. She hooks the leg like she's going to deliver a perfect plex and just drops down into a DDT. Does she call it something? Maybe she's had this move for months and months and BC just never really caught the name of it. So... So color me casual at that point, right? You can label me a casual fan for that moment. I'm fine with that. Tell me what it is, Kevin Patrick, right? That's what you would want to know. Sell the wrestler's finisher. That's your job as a commentator. She hits this move. Nobody says a damn word about it. They just said, and I quote, Shotzi for the cover. Three seconds later, Bailey is pinned. Do finishers mean nothing anymore? And by the way, if anybody knows the finisher or has a a thought on it, again, maybe she's had this for months and, and Shotzi's been so irrelevantly booked, I wouldn't even blame myself for not knowing it. But jot it down below if anybody does have a clue what that finish was because Kevin Patrick sure as hell didn't. Michael Cole and Corey Graves sure as hell didn't give a damn to tell anybody what it was. Finishers mean nothing anymore. That's why like 50% of the matches end in fruity roll-ups these days. Anyway, 
I digress. Back to the match itself. Like I said, Bailey was pinned by Shotzi. Now, the real story here is what happened outside the ring. Asuka returns after a several week hiatus and she takes the women's championship from Dakota Kai, who was holding it for EO while EO wrestled with Bailey. So Dakota Kai's on the outside holding the title and not doing a very good job. If you hired Dakota as head of security for a bank, you'd lose all your money in probably an hour. <laughs> so Asuka just comes over, takes the title from her. Asuka gets in the ring and lays it in front of EO Sky Shirai. EO Sky is looking at Asuka. Asuka's looking at EO. The title is laid out in front of them. An epic face to face that we have all been waiting for. Are we finally getting it? We're thinking, right? They've laid some seeds down before and nothing planted from those seeds. So here you were like, no, this is like on purpose. This is by design. You have to believe that they're setting this up. And then you immediately think, okay, what's the next pay per view? Is it a big stage? Because that's where they need to be. And of course not. It's October 7th, I believe, Fast Lane. And I'm like, man, Asuka, Io, a dream match. By the way, they faced each other in the past, but that's just a piece of what they can do. Um, th- they have so much more in the arsenal that they have not even touched upon yet. So much potential between these two. That's why a lot of us still look at this as a dream match. I know. I just want to clarify that because a dream match is usually two people that you've never seen before. A lot of times it's from different eras. But a lot of people still look at this as a dream match because it's two of the best to ever do this, Asuka and Io, and we just haven't seen enough of it. Uh, Not in WWE's main roster anyway, for sure. So here you have one of those things where it's like you want it on a grand stage, SummerSlam, Mania, uh, okay, Consolation Prize Survivor Series, or a Rumble. But no, Fastlane. But then they did something very odd. About a half an hour later, we'll cover this in an hour or two, but I, I might as well... I might as well mention it now as well. They said that it's it's actually going to be in two weeks on SmackDown. Now, first and foremost, it better be in the main event. It better be. But on top of that, it's very odd. They're trying to load up these Friday night shows, and it's it's not because of football, obviously. I mean, you got most of the bulk of colleges on the Saturdays. You got the football on Sundays and then Monday night. This is obviously for their TV rights deal. They know that they're trying to push Fox up against the wall to give them a substantial increase in rights fees, or at least the revenue that WWE is going to be getting, it's, which is going to jack up the price for Fox. Now, Fox is saying absolutely not. In fact, I'm hearing now that Fox is actually canceling their out-of-character podcast with Ryan Satin, I believe his name is, which is a big thing that Fox was doing. They've canceled that. This could be a little bit of insight as to what BC has been telling you for months The head of Fox has been already saying he is not going to meet WWE Nick Khan's demands for what he wants for their next round of negotiations. In other words, let me put this in in, in simplistic terms. Fox is ready to walk out on WWE. (laughs) They're not going to renew if they think that Nick Khan is going to jack up what they want in revenue. And guess what? Nick Khan has already said they're going to jack up what they want in revenue. He already says that they feel that the the current deal is undervalued, underappreciated. So he feels like they're already getting screwed, that WWE got screwed out of this deal. Fox is saying, dude, you haven't really got jacked up over 2.223. Some weeks with a specialty, okay, 2.425, but you're not really... I mean, we were hoping that we could be getting 3.3132 on the average, So Fox is probably looking at it like we're over, well over half a million viewers less than what we were projecting. So Fox is thinking they're getting screwed out of the deal. And now Nick Khan is going to come over and go, we want 35% increase. Excuse me? (laughs) That's why Fox is already saying, they've been saying for months, we are not going to meet demands that are irrational. That's irrational. The ratings are not showing that they deserve 35% more. Um, in, in, in value. So I actually agree with Fox on this. So my point is though, that, that they're just starting to jack these, these shows up right going forward. For instance, 
Uh, L.A. Knight versus Miz is scheduled for next week, the big rematch. John Cena is scheduled for next week on the Grayson Waller effect. In two weeks, you're now going to have a championship dream match with EO versus Asuka. They're really starting to jack these up. I think Rhea's defending her championship against Raquel on Monday. That's double-edged. They want to really up the uh, next deal with Comcast Universal USA. But at the same time, they're going to try to counter Monday Night Football action. So that's double twofold. But for SmackDown, this is clearly to try to get Fox their one last Hail Mary, if you will, to get Fox to get on board with what they're asking. And Fox has already told them to screw off. So it's very odd you would think up front that in two weeks they're going to do this dream match. But guess what? This is what happens in business, man. They're really trying to up those those ratings. They want to really put it, Fox up against the wall into the corner, I should say. And they're going to they're going to put this dream match on TV, man. I don't know. Even October 7th at Fastlane, I felt this was an underwhelming stage. You know, of course we would love to see this at a WrestleMania, but this is their company. This is the stage they're giving them. Now what you do as the performers is you go out there and you show them why you should have been at WrestleMania. <laughs> you perform to the most amplified of measurements, man. But it's one of those situations we have to look at the positive and hope that it's just outweighing the negative. This is EO versus Asuka with a championship title on the line. Two of the best to ever do it. When it comes to Asuka and EO, you can't teach that. It's just skill personified. Now, I just hope they do it beautifully. Get, let them be as creative as they want. Give them ample time and let them rock out. Of course, there's obstacles when you're trying to get fans excited to see a TV championship match as opposed to a championship match at a pay-per-view. At TV, we have a bunch of commercials that are interrupting what is most likely going to be a really good match. Nobody's looking forward to these interrupting commercials. You have TV time to deal with, right? So when you're looking at the clock and there's four minutes left of SmackDown, you know the match is ending within four minutes. That's not a good thing, right? That's You want to suspend the disbelief, suspend the clock, at least with pay-per-views. You don't know when that match is going to end. So my point is there's a lot of obstacles that, that present themselves when you are doing a match like this on TV. That's why a lot of us are not fans of it. But business is business. I know exactly why they're doing it. And you got to believe, too, is there going to be schmozzery? And are they going to run it back at, like, fast lane? Are they going to try to drag this out to, like, a Survivor Series? In which case you say, hey, more EO, more Asuka. I'm down with it. Yes, but if not done correctly, you're just diminishing EO and Asuka in value as we go down the line. And what I mean by that is if you see a seven-minute match that ends in schmozzery in two weeks and you set up another match... Are we going to be as invested in the next match? We've seen them wrestle for seven minutes. We've seen the schmozzery. Now in everybody's dome piece subconsciously, we're thinking, oh, are we just going to get more of that from damage control? And let's just say at Fastlane it happens again, and then we get the third match at Survivor Series. That's what I mean. I'm okay with seeing a, a best of three out of these two, but you have to do it correctly. If you do this half-ass and you do this in a way where it's actually diminishing itself and diminishing people's excitement, wow, this went off the rails real quick. You don't want to do that. So anyway, I don't want to think in that realm right now. I want to be in the positive realm. I want to stay as excited as I am. For now, we're getting EO and Asuka. It sucks it's on TV in two weeks. We'll see what they do. We'll see how they build this. But beggars can't be choosers. We have EO. We have Asuka championship on the line for bc man main roster wise this is absolutely a dream match because again everything i've seen between these two before just a piece if done correctly man eo and oscar could absolutely captivate the wrestling world Whew, two weeks on smackdown very odd decision but we're getting it man so that was the bigger story than the Bailey and Shotzi victory over Bailey and EO. Again, Bailey was pinned by Shotzi, the unorthodoxed wild woman. <laughs> LA Knight, yeah. 
was out next, Boston implodes with a mega reception for the mega star. He's about to answer Miz's challenge, but Grayson Waller and Austin Theory hit the top of the ramp. First it was Waller, and then Theory came out afterwards, and we get a back and forth promo between the three. Again, Knight is in the ring, Grayson and Theory, top of the ramp. Now, the piped-in boos for Theory were once again obnoxiously bad. Boston was rocking at this point, thus there was no need for those piped-in boos. And and it's just so noticeable. So noticeable, man. Boston was rocking. It wasn't really just crickets. There was still noise. You didn't have to try to make it seem like people are really booing Theory. It's not working. Cena even called them out on it, and they still do it. But to do it in Boston last night when they were already pretty much rocking, not needed, man. Um, After a commercial break, we have an L.A. versus Austin one-on-one match. Seven-minute contest. Knight pins Theory off the BFT, Blunt Force Trauma. What a moment, man. Uh, Because that's like some redemption. Because you guys remember a couple weeks ago, I think it was Theory that rolled up. Um, L.A. Knight, I think Miz like distracted him a little bit, and and or, and I mean a little bit, and then L.A. Knight was rolled up, and I believe that was against Austin Theory. So this is big redemption because there was a moment in this match, no joke, man. There was a moment where Grayson Waller caused a bit of a distraction, like the Miz did a few weeks ago, and Theory rolled up L.A. Knight yet again, like the same exact scenario. And I'm like, no, Knight is being hit with the fruitiness again. This company is not learning their lesson. You're only 50-50 booking the guy, which is keeping him stagnant. Sure, he's getting one hell of a reception, especially in Boston. But you're stopping him. You're preventing him from going to the next level with the 50-50 booking. Thankfully, thankfully, there was no fruit roll up. And moments later, BFT. It's almost like they wanted to troll the audience a little bit. They set up the exact scenario from a couple weeks ago. I was like, you got to be kidding me, bro. LA Knight with a massive victory here. And and you're just like, "Ah, BC, it's theory in the middle of a SmackDown. It's not that massive. No, it actually is for many reasons. Again, it's redemption. It puts away theory, hopefully, once and for all. Well, well, one-on-one, wait till you hear what I believe is going to start happening starting next Friday. I'll get to that in a second. But it takes care of theory. It wipes out that horrible loss via the roll-up a couple weeks ago. It starts real momentum for LA Knight number two because he just had the victory, what was it, last week? I forgot who he took out, man. Well, he got a big, I think it was Finn Balor, wasn't it? It was a big matchup. And he actually got that W. I think it was the main event even. So that was massive. And then he has another big W here. So back to back. So it was Finn Balor, Miz, or vice versa. Miz, Balor, and now Theory. Now what you have is momentum. This is called a trend, right? If it happens a couple of times, it's a coincidence, right? Or you got lucky. Hey, you got back to back Ws. Good job, kid. But when you go to three, four, plus victories in a row. Now what we have is a trend. The megastar is actually being booked like a true megastar. Starting to. I'm not going to, we're not going to put all the eggs into one basket. We're not going to start, you know, counting all of our fucking chickens yet before they hatched. But for now, this is the best we've seen LA night booking wise. Now into our number two. Uh, backstage, L.A. Knight is acquainted with Paul Heyman. Heyman once again makes it abundantly clear that he's not a fan of Knight. This is not the first time he's done this. Several weeks ago, Paul Heyman, this was on Raw too, I believe. I don't know why he was there. But uh, maybe he was smacked out. He was backstage. He had nothing to do with Knight. And he just took some shots at L.A. Knight. Just <laughs> talking about how he pretty much ripped off Stone Cold and The Rock and and uh, all the cute little catchphrases. And then last night, he's face-to-face with L.A. Knight, and he's once again just just wrecking this dude, talking about how he's got a cute little catchphrase. I get it. All the, all the fans, they, they, they say it because it's cool. It's catchy. He talks about his cute little merchandise. And then Paul Heyman gives him advice. Next time you see Paul Heyman in the office, do yourself a favor, and you do not come in. Is that understood? I mean, he literally barked this order to L.A. Knight, and L.A. Knight just says, yeah. So, I I, I mean, 
You know what I mean? You're like, oh, BC, it's, it's sarcastic, you know? Yeah. But no, he, he said okay, basically. The yeah is saying, yeah, I got it. So I don't know. LA Knight is kind of like, you know, do I want to go down that road with the bloodline? No matter what, seeds were planted. No matter what, I'm not saying LA Knight has to or needs to be the guy or should be the guy to take that title off of Roman Reigns. Time will tell. But if you think that Roman Reigns versus LA Knight is not a fun matchup that we'd all be anticipating with some damn solid excitement, man, you done falling on your dome piece a couple two tree too many times as a kid, man, because that is a pretty solid main event match Roman versus LA Knight I just would hate to see Roman defeat LA Knight because then w- this company has a problem once a Roman defeats somebody they don't know what to do with that somebody Big E quietly goes back to Big E loses his title right he took on Roman at Survivor Series a couple years ago loses that match quietly loses his title afterwards and even more quietly sneaks his way back to Smackdown and rejoins the New Day Cesaro after he lost to Roman you never heard from the dude again until he popped up in All Elite Wrestling and you could go down the line many names have tried to take on Roman 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 defeats them, and that's fine. But afterwards, the company had nothing for them. If that happens to LA Knight, I'd rather not see the match. And again, in hour number two, we would find out that Asuka and Io will be taking place in two weeks, September 22nd on SmackDown. LA Knight versus Miz would be made official. That's for next week on SmackDown. Miz, LA Knight. So Miz going over to SmackDown for next week. John Cena. Uh, will be on the Grayson Waller effect next week. This is his second time. What was the last time? Money in the Bank, I believe. So this will be uh, another appearance on the Grayson Waller effect. Now, this is what I mean about LA Knight and and uh, kind of still being in something with theory. You got to believe that Knight and Cena are going to be together and doing a bunch of tag team matches going forward against Grayson Waller and Austin Theory. You got to believe that. Theory and Grayson, I doubt this is going to be over with LA Knight. Cena's now coming on board. You got nothing for Cena, right? And for the most part, because when Hollywood does get back in order once this writer's strike is over and Jonathan Cena goes back to Hollywood, you know, he's going to want to be in one piece. So you got to believe his agent is like, more tag matches, the better. That's why he was at the India Spectacle um, just recently, yesterday. And he was in that right before SmackDown, that event was just going off the air, I believe. And he was in a tag match with Sethington Rollins versus Imperium. And you're going to see more tag matches with John Cena. You got to believe they're going to hook him up with um, LA Knight and they're going to take on Grayson and Theory. Maybe one week you'll get the Miz in Theory or the Miz in Grayson versus Cena and LA Knight. But you got to believe that this is their plan, right? Let's let him get a rub from John C. He doesn't need that, man. Doesn't need that. LA Knight is fine right now. I would say keep him away from people like Jonathan Cena. But uh, this is... Uh, it, and, and then we just get the, a bunch of the same type of tag matches. I'm done with Theory and LA Knight. LA Knight beat him last night. Let that be it. Keep Theory far away from LA Knight at this point, man. <laughs> And if you're going to put Grayson Waller anywhere near him, book up Grayson Waller the right way. Make us care about Grayson Waller on the main roster. So that all happened and was announced in hour two. The start of hour number two, though, was the Judgment Day. They defeated Holland and Butch of the Brawling Brutes. Damien Priest hit a South of Heaven on Holland. Think about that. Holland's a big boy. South of Heaven. And then sends Butch on top of Holland via another South of Heaven. Just slammed Butch right on top of Holland. Balor would then hit Holland with a coup de grace for the pin. Balor again pins Holland coup de grace. So post-match, the street business hit the ring. They square off with Dominic Finn and Damien. This is an odd face-off, bro. Who's the heels? Who's the faces? I still don't know what to think of Bobby Lashley and the Street Profits. I want to care about them. So much untapped potential with the Profits, and we all just, most of us anyway, love Bobby Lashley, and it's a shame that he's gotten the booking that he's gotten. And and I just, I want to care about this. I just can't. It's just Bobby thrown together with the Profits. And I just, I can't care about it like I did with the Hurt. I was hoping this was going to be even better than the original Hurt business with Cedric and Shelton and MVP. I'm just not getting the vibe. They just threw them together and it doesn't look like there's a plan. 
And they come out there last night and they're squaring off with Judgment Day. I don't know if they're heel, if they're face. I don't know how this is supposed to make us care about them. It's very odd, man. Very odd. Um, and then we go into the main event. AJ Styles defeats Jimothy Uso via pinfall. I believe it was the phenomenal forearm. Took my eye off the ball for a second. Had to fax over side business for like literally took like 10 seconds and the match was over. But I think when I glimpsed it was a phenomenal forearm and then moments later there was the pin. So I think the phenomenal forearm was at least a part of the sequence to end Jimothy Uso's chance at winning this main event post-match solo sokoa hits the ring but styles is able to peace beat feet and see ya <laughs> he said check you he went right into the outway i got my w i'm hitting the showers i'm out of here but the judgment day would take him out in the aisle way to end the show judgment day taking out aj styles this is such an odd ending such an odd ending man I got to be honest, I'm more into OC versus Judgment Day than the street business versus Judgment Day. <laughs> but still, man, now they're just taking factions and they're just throwing them out there against other little threesome or foursome faction groups. That's not that's not fun. I don't mind factions at all. But make it fun. I don't want to just see 17 matches with Judgment Day and street business going forward. Or the OC in, in the Judgment Day, 16 weeks in a row. Because then you could just mix, mix match every which, you know, have a bunch of tag matches and one man's out, put the other guy in. It, man, it, it's, it'll be as redundant as Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn versus the Judgment Day every Monday night. Just insert a Cody or a Sethington or a Matt Riddle, Scooter McGee, Flip Flops, Flanagan. Ah, uh, man, I just, you know, I want to care about this. It's going to take more than just randomly, and I mean randomly, the Judgment Day just attacks AJ Styles. What are you, what are you doing? Maybe Paul Heyman paid them off. Well, where the fuck were they before the match ended? AJ Styles already defeated Jimmy Uso. And he didn't do anything to Solo Sokoa, by the way. Solo went to take out Styles, but Styles was able to get away. So, the... the they're setting up like Judgment Day in street business earlier, right? At the top of hour two, they have that face off. So they're making you think, wow, street business and Judgment Day. And then at the end of the show, they're teasing Bloodline in Judgment Day, but then Judgment Day takes out style. So then it's OC Judgment Day. Judgment Day versus every faction is what they're trying to get you to think. If that gets you guys excited, that's great. I'm not even kidding. That's awesome. I'm trying to get to that point. So I'm going to need a lot more than what they did last night for me to see a bunch of factions just randomly wrestling every week. I hope that makes sense. That's your SmackDown review last night. A little bit of a mishmash, but you did have a lot of talent that was over in India, headlined by Jonathan Cena, Sethington Rollins versus Imperium. So it was a lot of Raw talent, but some SmackDown talent was there as well. So they may do with what they had. At least there were some big headlines here, man. Uh, again, EO and Asuka is the biggest thing right now. I don't know what they have. I don't even know if they have a plan right now. But in two weeks, you're going to get EO and Asuka. And that title will be on the line. That's a dream match for so many of us. And on top of that, LA Knight, man, takes care of Austin Theory. Gets a little bit of a big redemption from two weeks ago. Momentum is now on his side, literally, like booking-wise. And now, WWE surely cannot screw this up, especially signing a new five-year deal. And to go along with a story that I broke to you guys just a couple of podcasts ago, how Paul Levesque McMahon is very high on Zoe Stark, but he's not so high on Drew McIntyre, unfortunately. And you can see that in his booking. Well, a little bit of an update to that story. Apparently, McIntyre is, has been up for a renewal in his contract. Right, It's time to extend that thing and, and go over, dot the I's, cross the T's, and have a new contract for Drew. From what we're hearing, they have not even began those negotiations yet. Paul Levesque McMahon is in no hurry. In fact, the time after Mania that he missed, we're hearing that they just tacked it on. They just tacked it on. He was already going all the way through Mania anyway. Or at least damn near close. I forgot the original report that I was given. But I told you guys that he's not going to. He's still signed with WWE through the year. 
I may have been the only person to tell you that. But now they're tacking more time on. So Paul Levesque McMahon is in no hurry. But what it does is it kind of ruins the morale for Drew. He sees the booking that they're giving him. He knows it's shitty. Then they're in no hurry to, to, to give him a new offer. There's tacking more time on and they're like, eh, in the future we'll talk. But if you're booking like this, it's almost like they're, and it's not even almost because this goes exactly what I've been told from my people, that they're just not high on Drew. So maybe the plan here is to absolutely make him look like a fool, let him hang out with Matt Riddle the rest of the year. And then when it comes time for a new contract, they lowball an offer to him. And if he refuses, it wouldn't matter because they made him such a geek for over a year. He can show up to AEW and WWE is hoping nobody cares. I don't know. That's a big update on Drew McIntyre, man. He's, he's just, from what we're hearing, he wants to just get another deal or at least have conversations about another deal. And they won't even talk about it. Um, usually, you know, you get close. It's September, guys. If his deal runs out, and I think I was told it was a little more than the end of the year that he had time, maybe even toward mania. But the point is, when it starts to get this close, you at least start having talks, right? Nothing might get finalized till January, <laughs> but you start having the talks, and Drew wants to, but we're hearing that Paul Levesque McMahon is in no hurry, and then you see LA Knight just sign this quick five-year massive deal that we're hearing, and Drew's like, well, what do you got me doing? Riding a scooter down with flip-flops Flanagan Monday? Fighting some Vikings? Anyway, guys, um, much love and respect. That is your SmackDown review. And before, actually, um, before we take off, I want to give a big shout-out over to Jimmy Fingers 19 who in yesterday's podcast... Uh, sent over a mini banger, man, 25 spot, a bunch of coffees thrown to the channel by gold card member, a long time subscriber and channel member, Jimmy fingers, 19, 25 spot, bunch of coffees in yesterday's podcast. And I don't have the full, oh uh, man, I don't have the full super thanks, but I have the beginning. Uh, this is what Jimmy Fingers 19 says. I never thought I would ever see but bipolar punk ever want to return to the WW. And I never envisioned the WW ever wanting to, to do, do it with him again. But business is business. And Vince and Hunter McMahon have brought everyone back from Bruno to Brett to Hogan to Jim Helwig Warrior. Macho Man Randy Savage was on his way back. Yes, he was. He was starting to do commercials for them as well. Uh, but he passed tragically before it happened. Yeah, I, I mean, like I said, Jimmy Fingers 19, Punk is going back to WWE one day or another. If he went back to AEW first, fine. He will be back in WWE before his career is absolutely done. He wants to go back to WWE. He has wanted to go back to WWE. Sean Ross Sapp told you not, not long ago that at the end of the brawl out, he thought he was his contract was being bought out and he was trying to get in touch with WWE to see if they had an offer. And I can actually back up that I was hearing the same exact thing. So it's not many times that I'll actually go ahead and back up somebody like Sean Ross, but I, I will absolutely do that. It's exactly what I was hearing. Then we started to see him show up to Monday Night Raws, like <laughs> trying to get back into the locker room. He's already told us publicly that he would absolutely entertain offers from WWE. He told you he would go back. So I don't know what more proof people need. He's absolutely, and Punk is more... Punk, whether he knows it or not, and I think now he knows it, but subconsciously, um, he needs that structure. And even though WWE can be a sloppy shop, he just saw just how sloppy AEW is, and he did not help matters. He made it even more sloppy. But he knows he wouldn't get away with that in WWE. At Gorilla, having a fight in front of Paul Levesque McMahon and Vince McMahon, that would never happen. Brock Lesnar sitting over there in the corner watching you make a mockery of that Gorilla position. No, Brock would send you through the wall. He knows he cannot get away with that shit in WWE. And that's why you didn't really hear. Yeah, you heard he was upset and they didn't like Punk, but he, he just walked out. He was out and then they fired him on his wedding day is the famous story. But you didn't get this. Punk knows that he he's like Jim Ross and Jericho and all that, man. They would much rather be in WWE trying to get a WrestleMania main event. 
Jim Ross would love to be calling that WrestleMania main event. Jericho would love to be in that main event. Punk knows that's on the bucket list. That's the checkoff list. And they're watching Cody Rhodes do it. And they're like, damn. So am I surprised that Punk wanted to go over to WWE before he even signed with AEW? That's why he held out for so long. And finally, when he knew WWE was not making him an offer, he just took a boatload of money from Tony Khan. And then afterwards, after the brawl out, he was already, mind was already in WWE. Just didn't get the offer he wanted. Worked it out with Khan, came back. That didn't last long. Here we are again. You think he won't go back? It's going to happen eventually. But uh, Jimmy Fingers 19, yeah, it's, and, 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 and by the way, I can't get the rest of the super thanks up from, from what I'm looking at now, but uh, I did read that yesterday, that super thanks, and the idea that you have with Punk and Austin, WrestleMania 40, very interesting is all I'll say, man. That's an exhibition match that many, we're, we're talking dream matches, right? An Asuka and an EO, things like that. Stone Cold and CM Punk was a dream match, is still a dream match for a lot of people. So you put that on Mania 40 as just an exhibition match, no harm, no foul. Um, that would be, uh, that's intriguing, man. My only, my only thing against that is if Punk goes back to WWE, man, I'm thinking Punk Owens. I'm thinking Punk Zane, Punk LA Knight, Punk Roman. There's so many interesting matches, bro, you could do. Ah, oh, man, do, do, you, do you just put Stone Cold in there? Now, you also got to think athletic ability, Punk's age, 44, 45 years old, whatever he is. Uh, he's much more brittle. He's never really been athletic. So can he hang with these wrestlers in a match like that? So maybe Stone Cold would be better suited so you could have more of a fight over a wrestling match. So maybe Stone Cold would be the better option. But uh, interesting scenario there as well, Jimmy Fingers 19. I appreciate the coffees, man. Always good to see you up in here as well. And... That's going to do it for today's podcast. Until next time, and there will be that next time, the Amplified Man BC saying, check you. Top guys, we're out. Peace.